All right. What is up, you lovely listener? Welcome to another episode of Oversharing. As always, I am super pumped for this episode, but this one in particular, because today we actually have the founder of, co-founder rather, of Quavos, which is a, uh, it's a healthy snack based from egg whites, which I find to be really interesting. But more so than that, he's relatively young. And in the short time that they've been in business, they've already been featured on uh, incredible publications like ABC7, uh, Women's Health, among others. And they've achieved massive success already. So this conversation is something that I'm really excited about just to talk about not only the basics of maybe building your own business, but also the importance of personal connections between people as you are growing. So before I speak too much, let's allow Nick Hamburger to overshare. How are you doing, Nick? Hey, good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. Um, I'm super pumped that you're able to find time to do this. So thank you very much. Uh, how's everything in sh- Chicago? Yeah, Chicago. Well, uh, I'm in the suburbs now back at, at my family's house. Uh, I had an apartment in the city, but ever since the COVID madness, just wanted to get out and have more space. Yeah. So it's uh, not too bad here, although in the inner city, it's been really bad. And I think we're like the number four biggest hotspot in the country for the virus. Uh, that's, that's such a bummer, but good time with yeah. the family, I guess, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's cool. So I don't know if you know this, but um, you know these conversations are usually the first conversations. In this case, it's the second that we've been able to have. But what we didn't dig too much uh, into the first time we talked was what you were like in high school. So if you wouldn't mind giving us a little bit of background on you. For sure. Yeah. And I mean, as you said, I'm young. I'm 22. So I'm not that far removed from my high school self. Um, but, you know, I, I definitely had a couple different um, I guess, kind of periods of high school for the majority, like ninth to 11th grade was very focused on like girls and tennis and Mm -hmm. school and just like kind of had my head down and was, was uh, just um, pretty achievement oriented. But towards the end of it, I I think I became a little more introspective. Um, I had some experiences that I think happened to a lot of people just at some point as you grow up of like starting to just think about who am I and how do I want to be versus kind of, having that automatically happen for you when you're younger and you're just not analyzing it. And so, um, I don't know, I got into meditation, got very into philosophy, ended up studying philosophy in college, but, uh, um, kind of started to, to think about things more my senior year. You were meditating already in high school. I was, I actually, I was a big tennis player, um, as I alluded to, and and I got injured and I had six weeks on the couch where I like basically couldn't move. Mm. Um, and my mom was like, Hey, you should meditate because I had always been like the angry kid on the tennis court. Like, <laughs> really? Yeah. And no one ever believed me. No one who didn't know me from tennis believed that. Cause I was like, not an angry person, but I just had this very contained anger management issue when I would step on a tennis court. Yeah. Um, so she was like, yeah, you got to work on your mental game. And, and I, uh, she got me into meditation and it definitely helped with my tennis and, and just having a little more space. Uh, like you know seeing that reaction before i just smashed the racket but it also helped me in in uh more generally in life and and definitely changed my perspective your parents were probably pissed they were like dude we can't afford another racket so why don't you meditate before (laughs) we have to buy you another one i think i smashed five or maybe six uh, growing up and uh yeah it was (laughs) they didn't like it that's funny um So what we didn't touch on in high school is you actually started maybe one of your first businesses when you were there selling Japanese sodas in the cafeteria. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that was actually middle school. That was sixth grade. (laughs) (laughs) So, and I had the same co-founder as I have with my current business, Zach. And um, we had brought, uh, there was like a day in Spanish class that was like international day. It's like everyone bring some sort of fun food or drink from another country. So we bought, brought these Japanese sodas that like, I don't know if you've seen them, but they pop open, they have a marble at the top and you have to, you use like a plastic pin to kind of push the marble down and that like opens the soda. It's a very cool bottle and um, everyone loved the soda. And so we're like, Hey, like, you know, no one sells this. It's definitely not sold in our school. Like, why don't we just bring a few bottles in, in our pockets and kind of like under the table uh make some some transactions because it wasn't allowed like you're not allowed to sell stuff in the cafeteria but right we just kind of slyly did that and um got i think we each made like 200 bucks in profit within eight weeks but uh then we got caught and so we had to donate that all to the haiti earthquake which Mm. was a good outcome but um so definitely had a an early start in business and then we were 
I you don't know. Un- I don't understand why they stopped you from doing that. <laughs> I know it's like honestly, um, it's a good learning experience. Like uh-huh. uh, especially in pricing, we learned a lot about pricing and kind of pushing to that point where you start to see the demand decline, and you know that's kind of your 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 limit. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, and did they I, make I, you donate? They they were like, you can't keep the profit, so I'm going to make you donate this to to the Haiti relief, or was that a decision <laughs> that you made? We had had a, the problem was we had had a one week benefit for Haiti where we were donating the proceeds from like one week to Haiti. And then a kid got mad like a month later because he's like, they said they were donating it all to Haiti, but they're keeping it. And, and it was because we'd run like this one week benefit, but people didn't understand that. So um, that's why they just made us donate everything. So you're, al- you're also getting a, <laughs> you're also getting a lesson in crisis communication. Which is- <laughs> exactly. <laughs> crisis PR. <laughs> exactly. That's awesome, man. And so you actually ended up dropping out from college once you started Quavos, uh, which is, you know, I don't want to say one thing or another. I would never tell somebody to not go to college in a lot of respects. I, I wish I did too. But um, what was like the tipping point to where you felt like that was the right decision for you as opposed to, you know, trying to run the business out of, you know, while going to school? Yeah, it was funny because um, from very early, like it just felt right. You know, we did a business contest at, at University of Chicago, which is kind of where we got serious. And that was January to March of 2018 by we won that contest and by March like I was I was totally obsessed and then in um in the spring in class I was just doing email and like I was not focused on the coursework I was just full into it so I just got so obsessed that I had trouble committing the emotional energy um and getting motivated for school and so I said you know college is expensive and I also want to be like if I'm in class I want to be learning as much as I can I don't want to be half-assing so you know, plus I felt like it would take away from my productivity on the business. So mm. just decided to only focus on one. Were you already making money at that point uh, in Quavos to where, you know, like financially, maybe you could uh, uh, sustain yourself. You mentioned you had an apartment in the city, right? So um, were the, was the business already funding kind of like your lifestyle at least? Um, honestly, at that point, no. Um, you know, like Zach and I took uh, the first year we took off from college, we lived at home. So we just, you know, we tried to reduce expenses as much as we could. Um, year two of being off is when I got the apartment. And at that point, I started paying myself enough so that I wasn't losing money. Um, mm-hmm. But really like, you know, um, hoping to make most of the money off selling the company in a few years and, and just from having equity. Um, but it's been, have paid, paid myself pretty minimally. Yeah. But the idea that you're even paying yourself in year two with a business that you started uh, and able to get your own place in this, because it's not cheap to live in in Chicago, right? So it's like you were pretty successful, at least in that respect. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think um, we're fortunate that that we were, we got to a position where we could do that um, for sure. And also, you know, I've been able to hire um, pretty good consultants and and Jess, we brought on full time in, in the fall. Um, so like it's, we've been fortunate that we haven't been constrained on, on, um, funds for employees. That's amazing, dude. Congratulations on that. And you. you started the company with your co-founder, Zach, who, uh, kind of came up with this idea, right? Like, um, he's diabetic, ha- was creating like, or was making egg whites for his snack and then saw the chip, but it didn't stop there for you because you mentioned that you ran into some uh, issues with production once you started putting it in bags and things like that. Can you tell us a little bit more about the development of the actual product itself? Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, I mean, it was many, many months of just hundreds of ingredients. We tried a bunch of different food processing techniques and went to different test labs, uh, around like to different manufacturers just to test their equipment. And, um, it was just, it was a lot. I mean, like, especially our, our product was very, it's very high protein and it's low carb, which means mm-hmm. you're always going to be fighting texture issues. Um, just cause that's not the ideal macro nutrient composition and uh, in terms of just for taste. And so we, we just had to do a lot of continuous iteration and we had to be honest with ourselves where we would sample with a hundred people. They, they thought the idea was great, but they didn't love it. And, mm. um, just kind of had to get that outside feedback because we always thought it was improving and it was, but it's like, if you're improving through something that's not great, you know, it's going to take many iterations to get to something that's really tasty. Um, and then in terms of like getting it to scale, we manufacture ourselves and that was definitely, 
Um, we did it in stages. We kind of had a pretty tiny batch operation just so we could get into a dozen stores. Mm -hmm. And then once we kind of saw, okay, there's demand, people like the product, let's scale up. It took us a few months to kind of get larger, uh, larger equipment and um, as well as hire more staff. So um, now we're, we're, we're really running well and, and it's smooth, but it's definitely a pain to kind of scale up your own manufacturing system. Yeah. So do you own that manu manufacturing now? We do. Yeah. And wow. we don't like, we didn't buy a building or anything. Like we lease, lease some space within a larger building, but uh, yeah, we have um, seven employees full time on, on production. Wow. I'm like so pumped for you right now. And I, I don't really know you, but the, the, <laughs> I'm getting to know you a little bit better. But when I hear about somebody that's like young hustling, making it happen, you I think even now you're just showing how much is possible for anybody that's looking to get started already. So I love that. Um, Thank you. You mentioned that you had some, you, you were able to get into the incubator, incubator program over at Kraft, right? Mm -hmm. So what kind of mentorship, what kind of resources did they give you that made an impact on Quavos? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because Kraft Heinz is this giant food company and they're in very, you know, very conventional products that aren't super healthy, but they're these legacy brands. And they made this incubator for small, super healthy brands. And, um, we definitely learned a bit from the executives there and about like overall go to market strategy. But I think a lot of the value was learning from the other health brands that we were with who we were pre-revenue, but they were all two plus years in market. So they were kind of like, you know, further down the trail and, and yelling back like, Hey, watch out for this, you know, um, watch out for the big, big boulder as you're hiking the trail. So <laughs> it was nice to uh, learn from the mistakes, but also get tips on not always the, the giant, strategic things but like literally hey this is how you make an amazon listing hey this is our mm. trade show strategy you know some of these details that just uh it's nice to have someone kind of offload their learnings versus having to figure it out yourself yeah that's actually really interesting you would think that sometimes or at least my my assumption which is usually pretty wrong is that you go to somebody like Kraft Heinz and they're giving you like this big unlock and like here's the magic to creating a ketchup that will last for years or whatever it is, mm -hmm. but it's like creating an Amazon listing and you have a pretty good Amazon profile uh, itself right now. So is that your main uh, revenue driver is Amazon or are you sell are you selling in retail too? Yeah. Um, you know, we have 325 stores and Amazon still does like two to three X the stores every, every month usually. Mm. So it is, it is really the, the biggest uh, sales channel. It's also growing the fastest for us. So um, it's been great. Um, you know, I, I spoke to somebody the other day, the founder of Busy Coffee, and he mentioned that, you know, there's a lot of little tricks and strategies that he used for Amazon and he got pretty detailed in it, which was interesting. But the question I posed to him was that, uh, if he felt that the branding and the actual package design makes a huge impact on the, um, on the sales on Amazon. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. And if you potentially went, uh, had different branding options, different packaging options before you hit one that you really liked. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think branding, I think packaging is your most important marketing tool as a food product. I think it's more important in retail because literally that's like the only thing a customer sees mm -hmm. on a shelf is your package. Um, it still definitely is crucial on Amazon, right? Because like people are looking at a sea of 12 little squares at once when they're deciding what to click into. I definitely think you want something that pops and that looks good, but, um, you know, it's also, you also have other tools. You can, you have nine images, you can have a video, you can have all that like brand story content. Um, but I definitely think, uh, it is crucial, but maybe not as, as important as it is in the retail landscape. Mm. So you have a co-founder, Zach, um, I saw your video on uh, ABC seven, like the morning mm -hmm. show that you guys have over in Chicago, which was really awesome. Uh, what is the separation of responsibilities between you and your co-founder? Yeah. So, you know, for, for one full year, we were like full time together, both living at home and our houses are like two minutes from each other. So we were spending every day together and um, we had a rough split of like, he was doing more of the sales. I was doing more of the fundraising um and ops but honestly it was kind of like it, we should have been more organized it was kind of like something would come in and it's like who does it you know mm. we would just so it wasn't very cleanly 
segmented. Um, he actually went back to school in the fall, uh, wanted to complete his degree. And so he's still involved with strategies on the board, um, but he's not full-time anymore. Mm. You mentioned uh, that you were uh, responsible for raising capital. Is that still something that you're doing today? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, I guess as the remaining full-time founder, like it's definitely going to fall on me, but um, uh, we raised one round back in early 2019 and now we're raising our like seed extension round. Um, so definitely, you know, it's, it's a fun process and I actually enjoy it. Um, and obviously the feeling when you actually do close someone is, is, uh, is great, but it's a ton of work. Yeah. What kind of work goes into that for you? Um, you know, it's, it's a combination of finding leads, um, which is like, kind of reaching out to past investors, reaching out to fellow entrepreneurs, say, Hey, do you know anyone, you know, can you make one intro? Um, sometimes you're applying to some funds will have like a 10 page application that like in order to get a meeting with us, fill out this giant application. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's, so there's that. And then, you know, once you get someone who's interested, kind of regardless of their level of interest, they're going to just ask you for materials. They're going to ask you tons of questions. Um, it can be frustrating because people can literally be, and, and honestly, I've done this to people trying to sell me stuff, right? If someone wants to be our Facebook marketer, I will be like, Hey, let's hop on a second call. And I have like 10 questions about how you operate. And, you know, so you never know how serious someone is, even if they're asking these questions, but yeah, I can, I've spent 10, 15 hours with leads that don't close. And so a lot of the time can be, can be on that. Yeah. Uh, on that morning show, they asked if you'd, if you, uh, would love to be on shark tank. Have you applied for that? Yeah. You know, we did apply, um, uh, for this upcoming season. So, um, it'd be crazy if it happened, but there's, I think there's like 10,000 companies that apply each year. It might even be more than that. So yeah. you never know. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, one thing I found interesting about that was that, uh, you know, we see like a five minute pitch and you, you're probably like, you're, you're the best case study for this. Like we see a five minute pitch of like, you know, Hey sharks, my name's Nick. And I'm, da, 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 and I'm asking for $10 million for 5% or whatever. And we see that five minutes, but those pitches actually go on for like an hour and a half, two hours, things like that. And they're just editing it down. So I can only imagine, especially getting grilled by those types of people, what somebody would have to go through. I'm not familiar with that world. So are they opening up the books from you, like checking out your branding, your go to market strategy, like all those things before you even get to like give your offer? Yeah. I, I mean, I've just heard from friends I know who've been on and, and I think it is like that, you know, it's like any investor meeting um, mm. where, but because it's like, they're trying to decide right then mm. they want to, it can take that long because it's not like they have a follow-up meeting or follow-up call. Like they got to choose. So they want to know everything and uh, they want to know it quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. You mentioned in our, uh, you mentioned in our preliminary conversation too, that, you know, you felt as if one of the keys to success through for you has been your, your focus on personal connection and emotional relationships, that type of thing. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. You know, and, um, honestly, sometimes I'm in the mood for this, but other times I have to push myself cause I just want to be like, okay, let's, let's go into a meeting and let's, let's be all business and, and, uh, let's be professional. But I've noticed that, um, with a lot of things, obviously sales to retailers, but also, I mean, I consider fundraising a form of sales, honestly, mm-hmm. right? Um, just that a lot of times these decisions aren't made completely rationally. Uh, they almost never, it's almost never like, oh, like, you know, I have an exact formula for how I want to invest in a startup. And if, if your numbers hit in every category, I'll invest. It's more like, do they believe in you, um, both the product and in you as the founder? And so like, um, you know, for you to show some personality and get to know them and um, be curious about them and just, it's not that you have to become close friends with them, but, but to have the meeting be not a hundred percent on the numbers and the fundamentals of your business, but as much time as you could spend just talking to them and having a conversation about your life and their life. Um, I found that to be very helpful. Can you give us an example of where maybe that emotional connection pushed that person into closing a deal, whether it's with a retailer or an investor, and it wasn't really at that point about the numbers or scalability or anything like that? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess one example would be, we were already in this retailer, but um, I went out to Maine to meet at the corporate office at at Hannaford, which is one of the chains we're in. And we were in there, but I just wanted to show my face, um, get to know them better. And then just it's helped us since to get access to certain marketing programs and 
um, you know, achieve better success within the stores. Because if you think about that buyer, they, they work with like a hundred products in, in the snack aisle. But if two of them have come to meet in person, it makes a difference when they're reviewing like who to put on that special display. Um, so I felt that to make a difference. And with investors, I think we've had a lot of success in this current round with people who said no uh, a year and a half ago, but who I've followed up with, I've kept in touch with. And mm. now we check in and, and they're like, they feel like they've known you for so long and watched your progress. And again, like, is that a rational decision? Like, a little bit, but it's also just like, oh, I'm familiar with you. I know you. I'm impressed. Um, and so you can just see how the, uh, you know, just someone's level of warmth and, and belief is kind of the, the key uh, factor that, that that's going to make them decide to contribute. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm sure that something that might go through their head is like, here's these two young kids asking for however much money. Uh, I don't know if they're serious. And then they see how much success you've had over the last couple of years. And they're like, oh, they were serious. I should probably get in. Yes, exactly. I think that's really a thing is a lot of people met with us and they're like, I like the idea. Um, it's pre-revenue. Like they're, they're, at that point we were 20, you know, they're 20. Well, let me, let me just follow them. And now they're like, okay, it's working. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely. What are um what are some of your, you know, you mentioned like, you know, following up with people uh, that you talked to in the past, but what are some of your other like hacks to creating better relationships with business partners? Yeah. Um, I mean, I definitely think like, you know, um, to, if, if it's an investor or someone like that, I would, I try to just start the meeting and if I, if I can take five minutes or 10 minutes, kind of however long until they start asking questions to just get to know them and hear about their business and their endeavors. Um, I think that is really helpful to not just immediately dive into, cause you know, any investor meeting, they just pepper you with questions. So to, to start the meeting with some, some more warmth and friendliness, I think is helpful. Um, you know, I guess it, it varies based on what the relationship is, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that one is, is key as well as I've, I've learned just, and a lot of people say this, but, um, you know, just to, if you're giving someone feedback to appreciate what they're doing right before you dive into that feedback. Mm. And I, I've had times where, you know, with our board or an investor, they don't do that for me. They just go straight into criticizing me. And because I'm conscious of it, I like, I guess it's, it's not like killing me, right. Or killing my motivation to work on a company, but I just go, man, I felt peppered by criticism versus if they would have said for two minutes, I'm really impressed with your Amazon growth. I'm really impressed with your retail growth. Here's all the things I think you need to do. Mm -hmm. It has a, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. How many people do you have on your board right now? Um, our board is just three people. So it's me, Zach, and then um, Michael Alter, who's a professor at the Booth Business School in New Chicago. That's pretty cool. Uh, so I kind of want to dive back into a little bit about like how you're managing yourself, right? Like as a fellow business owner, like I know that there's a ton of pressures that you're dealing with all the time. Are you going to close the next, uh, you know, cap raise? How are your products selling through? You're really overseeing everything when you're up there, uh, like kind of at the top managing everything, right? So what are some of the hacks that you have to stay focused on all of these things without like completely neglecting your youth at this age? Because, you know, you mentioned that, tennis and girls were something that you were interested in, in high school. I'm sure like those things don't necessarily go away. <laughs> yeah. It's um, at first, like the first year, I think I had a mentality of like, I just need to work as hard as I can all the time. And like, I remember Zach and I had one period where we're like it, we, we did a reflection and we're like, Oh my God, the last 42 days, we haven't taken a day off. Mm. And you know, I think you can, I guess it, this, this is like the one age where you can try to do that and it doesn't hurt like <laughs> your body and your health and everything. But like, I've learned that that's just not sustainable. Um, mm -hmm. I definitely got burnt out when I would push myself like that. And so I've worked on, I'm trying to take every Saturday off and I've, I've done like almost every Saturday in 2020, which I'm very happy with. Um, I've learned, you know, on a given day, if I just feel horrible and, and feel burnt, I can take 30 minutes or an hour and just relax and then get back to work. And so just like, you know, I think you can always feel like everything needs to happen right now. But over time, you realize that's kind of, there's certain times where things are urgent. But a lot of the time, that's just your, your own cortisol and your own like, you know, stress signals kind of mm -hmm. fooling you. Um, you mentioned that uh, you were into medita meditation uh, when you were 
in high school, maybe trying to, maybe trying to tame your inner Mac and row, but yep. what does your meditation look like today? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, every morning I'll get at least 30 minutes in. Um, so I've been consistent with that and it's super helpful. Um, I try to do something in the afternoon too, because just like the work day, you'll, you can get it so wound up and just to kind of ground that energy. Um, and, uh, then like, you know, I, I try to go on a retreat like once a year, mm. uh, um, for five days to a week where it's like no work. And I'm, you know, you go to some sort of retreat center and do like 10 hours of meditation a day. So that can be really helpful too. 10 hours of meditation in a day. Yes. A, depending on where it is, it can be like eight to 10, but uh, it's, it's nuts. And it's a different, it's kind of like, you know, the difference between casually running and then like doing a marathon, right? Like you're just going to have a deeper experience um, if you kind of immerse yourself fully. So it's been, those have been awesome experiences. What does a 10 hour meditation look like or not 10 hour, but what does even like a two hour meditation look like? I would fall asleep. That can happen. And honestly, with these retreats, like day one and two, you're just falling asleep, like almost like every time you sit down to meditate because you're, you know, like your, your body's just like, Oh, great. I have this, I finally have an opportunity to not work and just to freaking let it, let it all go. But mm-hmm. as you kind of recuperate your energy, you sleep enough, like days three and on, you just start to get super focused for one, which is pretty cool. Um, you, I find my experience becomes a lot more vibrant. I feel more like I'm a kid, like in a way, just cause I'm, I'm thinking less and I'm, you pay attention more to your sensory experience. Um, and I don't know, you just see, you just see things that day to day, you're not focused on like aspects of yourself or your personality, um, or certain thought patterns that might be running your behavior, but you're not always paying attention. Mm-hmm. Um, this is very illuminating. Is there, are there any like practical, you know, are there any practical results that you've seen from your focus on meditation into the, you know, into the growth of your business? Yes. Uh, I definitely think so. Um, you know, being able to see kind of when my mind's going nuts and just like, I'm, I'm, I'm getting lost in certain worries or, um, projections that are just, they're not really based on anything, but, but they're just maybe just based on fear or based on worry. And to see like, okay, I can take five minutes, kind of like slow that thinking down and get back to work versus kind of being all agitated. I think it's, it's very helpful just to reduce the amount of time you spend kind of lost in those sorts of thoughts. And, um, and also in, in certain moments, like, you know, in tough negotiations or things like that, where you're tempted to kind of get angry at someone. Um, I feel like I have, I don't smash the racket anymore. I have a little more space to be like, okay, I, I see that. I see that I could say something really harmful that would just totally ruin the dynamic, but let me kind of (laughs) bring it down a notch. So Mm. I definitely felt like it's, um, it's helped a lot. Yeah. That's amazing. I'm a big believer in that. I feel as if it takes on a different form sometimes. And the reason I ask you those questions is because I feel like for a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, the idea of morning routines and meditation always comes up in like, to the onlooker, sometimes it seems a little bit hokey, but you're another case mm-hmm. study of how uh, of how essential it can be to your overall function. Totally, yeah. Um, no, I love. I definitely know a lot of entrepreneurs who have like all the hacks, right? One of my friends does intermittent fasting, cold showers, like works out like crazy, and meditates like every day. Um, so we we definitely. Uh, <laughs> the routines are and then the, t- the tactics can can really be helpful sounds like a sounds like tim ferris to me right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> who are some of the uh who are some of the brands that you kind of look up to um you know as it relates to cuevos for example and why do you look up to them yeah gosh there's a lot i mean i love just the vibe and kind of the aesthetic of like all birds uh mm. warby parker um not necessarily that we'll copy that, but I just, I just think those, those brands are just cool. Like everything you interact with them is just, you're just like, wow, this brand's really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, especially their websites. Um, in terms of like brands we might try to copy, um, Quest, I think does a really good mm-hmm. job. Quest mm-hmm. Nutrition. Um, we also have similar pro- a very similar product to them, but they just, they send out so much product to, to influencers. They're all over social media. They send out fun gimmicky things like giant blow up, um, for their chocolate donut bar, they sent every, all these influencers to blow up chocolate donut <laughs> inflatable. So like, 
they just do things to get in front of people, but it's always fun and light and, and funny. And um, we definitely want to be that way too. Like I, when we were thinking about all the things our brand could be like, I just ended up saying like, it's, it's, it's two forty nine for a bag, like, you know, $2 for cents. It's not right. a Lexus. It's not Nike shoes. Like, like we got to keep it fun and light. I don't think we can be like a, a we can have serious ads like Rolex or something, right? Like, yeah. it's, it's just not an expensive or luxurious product. Right. Speaking of which, what are some of your marketing strategies right now to, you know, get more awareness around it? You've had, a t- you had a ton of PR in the beginning. Uh, you're killing it on Amazon. What else are you doing? Uh, is it influencers? Is it Facebook? Yeah. You know, we do a little bit of, of standard Facebook advertising. Um, I'd say most of the, uh, well, we also do like boring Amazon keyword advertising. <laughs> and then there's uh, like the biggest thing we do to get in front of new, new customers is influencer marketing um, mostly on Instagram, but then we're, we're venturing into TikTok now and mm. playing around with that. And we've had a couple of videos that get like 200,000 views and it's very, uh, we don't target like the famous people. We just target people who made an account and are having fun and you know, they don't expect crazy, uh, crazy levels of, of compensation. So it's, it's a cool space to play around in. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So what are next steps for Quavos? Do you see your, yourself going uh, outside of the chip and maybe into new products? Are you allowed to talk about these things? <laughs> yes, yes, I definitely can. Our goal is honestly to stick with the chips in many more flavors, many more different pack sizes. And um, that's if like, you know, that's the ideal scenario. Like our one of our mentors who founded Skinny Pop Popcorn like they just, they exited to private equity and all they had were just different sizes of popcorn and like three flavors. Like that means your product's just freaking amazing and mm. you can just keep getting into more stores. But with some brands, you know, it, it could make sense to launch other product lines. And we've got ideas for uh, protein cookies based with egg white, um, mm. puffs based out of egg whites, crackers. So like there's definitely a lot of snacks we can make. Yeah, that's amazing, man. So I love everything that you shared with us today. I think it's insanely valuable and uh, congratulations on all your success. If somebody wanted to connect with you after this, where can they find you? Yeah. Well, thank you for saying that. Um, you know, uh, our Amazon is definitely where we have the best prices and, and sell the most. So you can just type in Q U E B O S on Amazon for Quavos. Um, also you can check us out on social media, eat Quavos. Um, and please do eat some Quavos. Uh, um, but, uh, yeah, those are the two spots to go to. Are you guys on the West coast yet? Uh, we have a couple, we have like a juice bar, a couple spots, but we haven't really done a major expansion. So mm-hmm. we need to get out there though. I feel like, uh, California is the best market for this product. Yeah. I think, I think it'd be really cool. Um, okay. Final question of today. If you did get on, uh, if you get, did get on shark tank, who would be your ideal partner? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I like Mark Cuban. You know, I think he's both nice, which is always good, but also very connected in the athlete world where we would like some, some athlete influencers. And um, I'm sure he, he knows some, a lot of people in the retail space as well. So yeah, cool. I think he does invest in some of the, I think he did like snack lens or something. So it's like rel- relatively similar categories. Right. So it's definitely exactly. a shot there. Mark, I yeah. know you listen to my podcast every single day. Hit this guy up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Awesome, man. To the listener, thank you so much for your time and attention. We really appreciate it. If you love the episode, we would dig a five-star review. And if you didn't like it that much, feel free to stick it to us, but subscribe anyway, because we're going to have a ton of incredible people just like Nick Hamburger back on the show. Thanks again, Nick. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun.